Si us sembla, comencem amb aquest debat d'educació, que és l'últim, el darrer d'aquest any 2009. Veig força cares conegudes d'aquest fòrum de debat permanent que anem tenint al llarg de l'any. Tot i així, per aquells que avui assistiu al primer debat d'educació, doncs sapigueu que debat d'educació és una iniciativa de la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya i de la Fundació Jaume Bofill, doncs precisament per això, per promoure el debat sobre temes d'actualitat i temes de fons relacionats amb l'educació i amb els temes que ens semblen reptes claus per a la nostra societat des d'aquesta perspectiva del món de l'educació. És veritat que Debats d'Educació té aquesta vocació de parlar de l'educació, però de com l'educació afecta la societat i des d'una perspectiva de l'educació entesa com a bé comú i molt àmplia. Per això hem tingut debats que no han estat estrictament centrats en temes de centre educatiu o de sistema educatiu. Però el debat d'educació d'avui, amb el que es clou aquest cicle de l'any 2009, sí que tracta un tema ben bé centrat en el món del sistema educatiu i del centre educatiu, un tema que és, a més a més, d'actualitat en el nostre país, en el moment de l'aplicació de la llei d'educació, i amb aquest suggerent títol de Responsabilitat, Autonomia i Avaluació per la Millora dels Centres Educatius, hem convidat i estem molt agraïts de la seva assistència avui i que estigui aquí amb nosaltres, el professor Mats Elholm, que ens donarà a conèixer una realitat diferent, una realitat a la qual moltes vegades ens referim els que hi éreu en l'últim debat d'educació. Amb el professor Duprier vam acabar parlant de l'autonomia de centres i vam acabar fins i tot fent referència al model suec. Doncs avui tindrem l'ocasió de conèixer-ho millor, d'enriquir-nos amb la seva aportació, amb la seva experiència, en debats d'educació sempre convidem a gent, tant del país i d'aquí com de l'estranger, però que per la seva experiència, pel seu coneixement, pel seu currículum, ens poden enriquir i aportar moltíssim per pensar i poder replantejar també el que aquí estem fent des d'una altra mirada i des d'una altra actualitat. Per tant, penso que abordem un tema de futur, un tema de present, un tema clau, un tema que ens afecta i que afecta fonamentalment el nostre sistema educatiu i a la vida dels centres i a la comunitat educativa en general. Sense més, li passo la paraula al Josep Maria Mominó, de la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya, que ens farà una presentació més extensa i més com cal del professor Max Elholm. Molt bé, gràcies, Anna. Doncs si efectivament avui mantenint aquest propòsit de nodrir els debats amb l'expertesa que podem obtenir del context internacional i per fer atenció a aquesta relació crítica entre autonomia, responsabilitat, avaluació, millora dels centres educatius, comptem amb la presència privilegiada, diria jo, que ens proporciona en Max Eckholm, professor d'Educació de la Universitat de Karlstad i també de la Universitat de Gothenburg. El professor Einsholm acumula una llarga trajectòria en la investigació sobre el desenvolupament social i organització escolar que s'ha traduït en un nombre important de publicacions científiques en aquest àmbit. Ha estat director de l'Escola Nacional Universitat per al lideratge en educació i del Comitè Nacional d'Educació a Estocolm, director general de l'Agència Nacional d'Educació i per la Millora Escolar a Suècia i més recentment també director general del Ministeri d'Educació del Govern Suec. El professor Eckholm ha col·laborat així mateix en consells de ministres com a assessor en educació de diferents països, especialment en països nòrdics, i també amb d'altres organismes com el Consell d'Europa, la UNESCO i especialment amb la OCDE, on ha participat activament en la direcció estratègica del Comitè d'Educació d'aquest organisme. Davant els reptes que té plantejats el nostre sistema educatiu, tal com deia ara mateix l'Anna, especialment 
en la conjuntura actual en relació a la promoció de l'autonomia dels centres i també a la seva avaluació efectiva, ens sembla especialment rellevant l'aportació que ens pot fer el nostre ponent. Així doncs, professor Ecom, responsabilitat, autonomia i avaluació per la millora dels nostres centres educatius. Ok. I will do my best in Swinglish. That is something between Swedish and English. By that I mean I uh, actually think in Swedish while I am speaking English. And as you will see, I will take you on a little trip um, up to the north where we have made some experiences during the years. Uh, in the same direction as you have ambitions to go. So I will tell you something about my, the history of my country and especially the history of education in my country and to discuss some, let's say, strategic moves that we made during the years. But I will start by saying something about a basic problem in educational systems. You know, when we started to create schools, it's a long time ago. And you started much earlier down in the Mediterranean than we did up in the north. So about 2,000, 2,500 years, we started to do this thing, or we invented this peculiar idea that we could send over culture by talking to people. And we talked, and we talked, and we talked. And we thought that the talk was taught, that we were teaching. So we created two roles, one for the talker, and we call that teacher in English. In my language, it's called something else, in yours, professor, uh, professor, professor. Uh, and we were going on with this for hundreds of years, which was effective. We gave a role to the person who was a learner to listen carefully. Sometimes we even thought that people learn good by listening so carefully so that they could repeat exactly what the talker had said. We have finished to think in that way. And we made some changes over the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years when we had this invention of schools going on in our countries. When we reach around 500 years ago, we put forward an idea that was started to get practiced only 100 years ago that a school is not actually a place where you educate. A school could be a place where you learn. And that is a sort of interesting revolution that happened in the creation of schools. That we were placing the student in the center of things instead of the teachers that the teaching is not the most important activity that is going on in a school, but learning. And when you start to do a sort of Copernican revolution in your head and see that actually the old invention of a school where someone was telling and telling and telling and telling and, te and telling, and you chose another role of the one who was earlier the listener to become a person who was asking questions instead of answering questions, who was talking instead of listening, who was creating knowledge instead of getting served with knowledge, then you have another school. When we start to practice this idea on schools, and we start in Europe, we tried to do it in the 1700s, in the 1800 and in my country, we start to really practice it in the end of the 1800s. The Americans made it then. Some French, some Germans. But usually that idea was a very isolated, small part of the educational system. In Sweden, we had a debate on the role of the teacher about 100 years ago. When we said to each other that let's go for this more interesting idea to make a school a place for learning instead of a place for teaching. And then we started to rebuild our old school system. We have made it in several steps. 
we said to ourselves when we had created a school for everyone, uh, we started to work on the concept of creating a school where everyone was meant a learner. But we didn't start that, well, actually we started that project, you could say, in 1919, around 90 years ago. And uh, our politicians at that time said to themselves and to others, to the public, that let's change the basis of our school. Let's start to create the school where you go for learning and not so much for teaching. In the beginning of the 1920s, in the 1930s, uh, when you were having war with yourself, we were a peaceful country. We haven't been at war for 200 years. So we have almost forgotten how to go to war. But in this peaceful time, we reshaped our national educational system to become a system where you started to work more and more with creating a school where the learning activity was in center. There was a lot of resistance against it, especially from teachers. Teachers were fostered to teach, to talk, to show, and they were asked in the 20s and 30s, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, to change their main idea of what they were doing in school. We wanted them to be supporters to learners, to become helpers of learners, but also to become challengers to the learners. Because we need to put demands on the learning part of the students in the school. We wanted to create a school where action of the students were question of themselves, that they combined with actions, showed them what to learn. And we are still working on this project, I have to say. We only have struggled for 90 years and we are not there yet. So it takes some time to change school systems and especially to change the mentality of people working in schools and also changing the ideas of parents who send the children to school. But I will tell you about what we were doing because during 1900s we took a big step when we changed our school system in, 19, in the 1950s. After the Second World War, we said to each other that we need to create a school system where people go to school and train not to be obedient. We need to train people to be disobedient in our school system. We want to foster people to be parts of our democracy, we need to have students to, who are not listening too much to authorities, but think themselves. And we also said to ourselves after the Second World War that we want to create a school where people go together from all social classes. And we sent out our old elite system where we had streaming going on, where we wanted to pick out an elite of people uh, when they were 10 years old, we wanted them to go to different parts of the school system. And we said, we will close this down. And then we used a strategy to change our school system in the 50s, where the state said to our communes, as I call them in Swedish, our municipalities. At that time, we were around 2,000 municipalities in Sweden. And we were asked as municipalities to make experiments with a new school system where we wanted everyone to go together for nine years. In Sweden, we are slow beginners. We don't send our children to school until they are seven years old. And then we made experiments during the 50s with different solutions on how to keep everyone in the same school and to create, create a learning for them that really gave them everything that we dreamt of. Today, uh, 60 years later, you could say, we have made our choices. The first choice we made in 1962, when we created what we call our Grundskola, our ground school. And our ground school is a school that comes in when you are seven years old, where 100% of our young people participate, 
where you go, whatever you are, how talented you are or how non-talented you are, you go together. We have a small, small portion of students who have real difficulties to learn. Children with Down syndrome, for instance, we sign them in in what we call the special school where we have about one percentage of a year group but they go together with the others in the comprehensive school that we have created, in the ground school. Before that, in Sweden, students or children go to preschool. You usually start when you are around one year, one and a half year old. And at that time, about 40% of us go to preschool, where we participate until we are five years old. And then we go over to what we call a preschool class. About 90% of those who are five years old go to preschool. The others don't go to the preschool because it's usually too far away from their home. Because we live in a country which is um, big on the surface, which means that there are few people in Sweden. We are 23 people per square kilometer when we look at the whole surface. So we have a lot of fun with animals and with forests and other things. But when you are six years old, all of us go to preschool class, which is a political compromise, where we couldn't make up our minds 20 years ago. If we are, were going to start with our Grundschule when we are six years old, or if we could finish the preschool when we are six years old. So we created a mishmash. And we still have it, and it will stay for a while. We when we have gone through the Grundschule, where all of us join together, and we go there for nine years, then 95% of a year group continue into what we call gymnasium school, where you have 16 different national programs. Uh, four of them is preparing you for going to the university exclusively. The others are more or less directed into vocational life but they are also preparing you to go to the university because we have that ambition that actually no one can escape from having a possibility to go to the university. So when we look at the effectivity of that form of school today, we see that uh, about 65% of a year group is prepared to go to the university when they are 19 years old. About 50% of them go to the university. When we have done this, we, you could say that our way on the road to create a school system with a high degree of comprehensivity is to, well, to be very comprehensive for the students. We try to go together. Uh, we, in the Grundschule, where we go together for nine years, well, children really try to stay if you stay in the, if the parents don't move around, they stay in the same class with the same classmates mates for nine years. And it works, and I will show you how it works a little bit later. The system is uh, decided on by, you could say, four big actors. We have the parliament. The parliamentary system is uh, having elections every fourth year. Then we make an election of a new government. And in Sweden, during the last 60 years, the Social Democrats have been in government for uh, 45 years. So they have, a, uh, they have dominated the scene, so to say. Uh, and then when you look at the little state of Sweden, we are a little bit bigger than Catalonia. So we have uh, 9 million inhabitants. And I think that you have seven. Uh, so we are about your size. But in that size, we have 290 communes. Uh, and that is, a commune is a small district, which its own parliament, its own little communal government, where we have autonomy for the commune, which I will come back to, to and especially within education. Within the commune, you have several schools, as I call them, educative centers in your language uh, and 
they have a sort of autonomy too. And I will quickly explain in what degree. Because the parliament uh, takes decisions about the overall structure. For instance, the structure of the preschool, the preschool class, the Grundschool, the, uh, the, the, the gymnasium school, and the university. That is a decision taken in parliament. Uh, in the parliament, you also take the laws that regulate the goals, the overall aims of the school system. The government has as its task so to decide on details on the aims and to formulate it and give a lot of, of, of tasks to its authorities. We have a Swedish tradition where you keep small ministries of education and then we have several agencies, state agencies. I was, for instance, for a while the director general of the state agency for education, where we were responsible for developing syllabus for the subjects in the schools. And I was also responsible for making national evaluations of our system and creating our participation in international comparisons and several other tasks. But the government have the power to decide on the, their own ag agencies. Within the commune, the commune is getting a, a lump sum of money to deal with its taken from the taxpayers' money, and then the commune have to take its own decisions on what are we using this money for. And within the education, the, the, the commune decides on the money how much money are we going to give to the schools that we are responsible for in this community. The schools have the responsibility to decide about details about where are the money going. So it's a lot of money running around. And the money, will we spend a lot of money on education. If you take uh, the costs that we spend on one of the students in the Grundskola, we spend uh, we have Swedish kroner, but if I translate it into euro, each year we pay about 8,000 euros per place. If you look at the, the, the money that we spend for the preschool places, it's more. We spend about 11,000 euros per preschool place. So we care for the small children and want to have them together with a lot of grown-up people, with adult people, with teachers. The schools are responsible, responsible for producing results, to get things into the heads of the students, or to get the students to learn. So that's what the main idea. Um, when we look at the, our system, uh, you could also say that in, in the commune, um, the, the, there are some, let's say, key happenings that goes on in the commune and in the schools. The, the uh, commune is responsible for the appointment of teachers. It is the commune who pays the salary for the teachers and for the school leaders, the directors of the school, we call them rector. Um, and the local board of education in the commune is the one who appoints a director the one who appoints the teachers is usually the local director of the school who is also responsible together with the unions to find a individual salary for each teacher. So we have left the collective tariff for teachers on salaries. We have individual salaries for teachers. And the school director or the rector when I think Swedish is responsible for really making a difference between the teachers, which puts demands on the rector or the director to be well informed about what the teachers do and what results they reach. Not only what the results the students reach, but also what the, re the teachers reach. Um, the decision on how much money we use on education is of course taken by the parliament and the government is making proposals and then the money is spread out to the communes. 
Within the communes, we also have discussions and have decisions to be taken about what school is going to get the most money, where do we have the most severe problems, where do we have, where do we have most immigrants, for instance, don't we need to give more money there, where do we have the lowest tradition of going to a school, we have to spend more money to help the teachers to reach better results in these areas. So that is a decision taken in the commune and where the schools have to act on it. We, if I make it rather simple, you could say that our politicians have since the 20s, 1920s, said to our school teachers and school leaders that we want you to help the students to develop in such a way that when they leave school, when they are 16 years old or 19 years old, we want them to know how to think. And we have, of course, as you have, a lot of uh, school subjects in which we want students to think. We want them to think history. We want them to think chemistry as you are. But we also want students to know how to feel. So we have written into our national curriculum about emotions. We want students to develop ways to express things, not only with their spoken language, with their written language, with their bodies. We want them to dance in a most passionate Swedish way. And we want them to express themselves in more than one language. We haven't chosen Catalan. We have chosen English as the first uh, foreign language, so we start with that when we are seven years old. So usually you meet people who can speak English in Sweden nowadays. Uh, and we then, when we are uh, 12 years old, we make a selection of a new language, and you could say that not Catalan, but Spanish is chosen by a third of a year group as their second language. Then we choose Fran French, or German, or Russian, and some few try to find a Chinese teacher, but it's not very easy in Sweden. Uh, and we use language then, so we, we have said to ourselves that people need to know how to express themselves in different languages. We want students to create, but also to produce. We are actually having a subject that we call handicraft, or slöjd in Swedish, where we are working in woods, and we are working in textiles during school hours to show people that it is important to produce. We also want people to learn how to decide. And this have we been doing since the 1920s. In the 1990s, we invented a new goal. We have said to each other that even if people learn a lot at school, they will never stop learning. So we saw the terrible effect of computers, for instance. When you live together with computers, you need to learn and relearn and relearn because some peculiar people change the software all the time, as you have seen. So even if you call yourself an adult, and 100 years ago an adult could be a well-educated and a person who have finished their education, we say to our school children, you will never finish. Give up that hope. You have to learn how to learn. So we nowadays train each other to learn how you learn. We also, if I make it very brief, say to each other that you need to be in specific ways. And we have said to each other since the last Second World War that you really need to be trained to be an independent person who is able to cooperate on an honest base. Not totally honest, but yeah, we say that we need to be brutal, honest with ourselves. Don't lie to the yourself. And that is what we try to help young people to develop during school years. And we want them to develop awareness and responsibility. This to be able to participate as adult people in an independent but cooperative and responsible and aware, conscious way in the democracy. And what we also have said to each other in our national curriculum is that we really want all young people to dare to use 
what they know and how they are acting. When we have chosen this, and as I said, our national uh, curriculum is actually going back to the 1920s. It was changed in the late 50s, and we have been working with different versions of it since the early 60s. But we have also tried to measure, are we reaching these aims? And to show you a, a small example, you could look at this one. Here I have an item from a national evaluation where we in 1992 and 95 and 2003 uh, put a lot of questions to students where we created scales, for instance, to measure uh, in what way their, their independence was developing during the school years. Here you have a, a, a question that says, that we present to the students, that your teacher tells you to find out in what way a product is made. You are asked to read about it in the library. On your way to the library, you realize that one of your neighbors know a lot about this production. It would be quicker and a more easy way to phone him. How would you do? And when we asked the students that one, we gave them, as this was given to 12,000 students in different ages, but I will show you the results from a specific commune to show you what happens during years in Swedish schools. We gave them three alternatives to be able to do this in a quick way. Here you have the response alternatives. One would be to be a very obedient boy or girl. I do as the teacher says. I go to the library and I read it in, about it in a book. The second alternative you see as a not that obedient. That means that you go back and stay as an obedient person and ask the teacher if I can use the idea that I have. So you ask for permission of being independent, which is not exactly what we mean with independent. And the third is an alternative that is the most independent one. Well, if you have an own idea, follow that one and then see what the teacher says. And here you see what happened when uh, in one of the communes they used this question from when the students were 10 years old, and that is called class 4 in this diagram, or Årskurs 4, as it says in Swedish. Uh, and here you see what happens over the school years. So this is school year 4 when you are 10 years old, 5, 11, 6 when you are 12 years old, and the 12th year, then you are 18 years old. And here you see what happens with the first alternative, those who are obedient over the years. In this commune, the schools could say, hooray, we succeed to make them less obedient over the years. Here you have the students who say, I go back to the teacher. I ask for permission of following an idea of my own. And here you have the students who say, well, I take the risk. I make up my mind, I test my own idea, and let's see what the teacher says. And you could say, in this commune, they were not too happy with this picture. If they had been really happy, they had had a much steeper development of the yellow one to go up. So that is one way where we have tried to evaluate whatever goal, whatever aim we have formulated for our schools. We are keen on evaluating because we know that if we evaluate, we can have a civilized discussion about why things are going so well or why things are not going well, so that we can create a better school. And to give you some more insights in how we do evaluations, I brought with me what uh, people have been doing in another commune where they wanted to see how variated is the school day for the students. They asked the students, two students of each of the classes in that commune, to make observations of what teachers and students were doing. So this is not a professionally made study. It is not researchers. But this is how we work, that we ask students to look at what we are doing. Actually, we train the students in the classes by looking at videos on how you can how you can recognize different working patterns in the school. And then they use these working patterns and decided on what have we experienced for, a fif for 15 minutes now. 
and then they made a mark on a, a, on a marking sheet. And here you have how many percentage of these 15-minute uh, periods that were used for different, in different ways during two school weeks. And as you see, the most, at the time that was creating the highest frequency is working alone for the 11 to 13 years old. And that is also the largest uh, uh, proportion of time, 58 percentage of the time for the 14 to 16 years old was used for working alone to, to do things uh, on your own. And as you see, discussion was spent 40, minutes, 40 percentage of the time. And then you can understand that these young people, they couldn't make up their mind that a quarter of an hour was used for just one thing. They have said that it was used for more than one thing. Why do I show this for you? Well, the 17 to 19 years old, uh, you see that listen to the teacher take a little bit more time for them and uh, they are spending more time at the computer. They are spending less time on making investigations, which was important for people in this commune to see that actually students in the lower grades were, were trained to make investigations. But when they reached the higher level of the school system, that talent or that uh, capability was not used very much. So this is pictures that we take up in our schools about the working life there. And I also uh, brought with me some of the routines that we have because we try to put evaluation into the normal flow of the school year. So each year the school is responsible for assessing its results and to find out and make up its mind about the quality of the inner work. So we try to relate the learnings, the learning results of the students to what we have been doing during the years. And I just show you one example of from one commune, how we try to catch what is done so that we can relate what is done to the results. Because if we can do so, the school have a possibility to improve itself. Each year in our state, the state asks the commune to make a quality review of the state status of the schools in the commune. And the commune is asking the schools to make a quality review each year. The review that the commune is presenting is also presented at the web. The quality review that the commune is making, that is so to say a self-declaration of our results and our way of reaching these results is sent in from the commune to the National Agency for Education where the 290 pictures are put together so that we keep an ongoing diagnosis of the quality of the education in our little country. We have other evaluation normalities, as I call it in this PowerPoint picture. In Sweden, you don't mark the student when they are six years old or seven years old. We wait until they are 12. Why? Well, we don't see any need for marking students. We can do other things, and I will come to them. Uh, teachers are trusted, so teachers are producers of knowledge tests. They are testing the students in their own way during the whole duration of the school years, and they are the ones who are trusted to mark the students. Each half year, the teacher, each student, and the parents, or the parent, if it might be one parent, uh, of the students is coming together for what we call a development talk. That is a, a, a bi bilateral uh, 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 evaluation talk, you could say, where the student is sitting with their, all of the students in Swedish Grundschools, for instance, have an individual learning plan. So they have it there, and they have a discussion with the parent and the teacher about, is this plan working? But they also spend time during this hour that it usually is spent on this development talk, talking about 
what about what you are doing as a teacher or the teachers are doing to me? How do I react on it? What type of critical remarks do I have, both positive and negative? And the parents have a say in this development talk. So it's a three-party meeting when you have that as a routine. And we have had that for now 20 years uh, with the development talks. We, at the same time as the teachers are, are responsible for knowledge tests, we produce national tests and they are nowadays compulsory in grade three and grade five in two subjects, in Swedish and mathematics, where teachers usually are using these uh, compulsory national tests as a calibrating force when they are putting the marks later on in the school system. In grade nine, we have three national tests in Swedish, mathematics, and English. And in the gymnasium school, there are several subjects that have compulsory national tests to help the teachers to get a feeling of where is the, my students. It is not examination testing. It is a testing that is done in the middle of the school year to help the teacher to find a level of the markings. We also publish the aggregated results of the national tests for grade nine students. It is published on the internet for each school. And we also publish the markings that is made of, this, of the students in grade nine. So that is a very open thing in Sweden where you can go into the net and find statistics about each school and looking at it and it is used in several ways. During the years, or in 1986 actually, we said to each other that we need to have a better grip more often of how our school system is working. So since then we, we actually said that we ought to have national evaluations every third year. And we haven't had it because it was a little bit too tight because schools are slow working organizations. So when we see that results are not perfect, we need to make improvements, it takes longer than three years to make things better. But we started optimistically in 1989, 92, 95, 1996 it should be said. And then we waited for five years to 2003 and it will come up soon a new national evaluations. Uh, we also use data from different international evaluations of the school system as components of our national evaluations. And we have participated very long in the interesting competitions that some international organizations are arranging for us as nations. It began with the IEA, where we started in 1964, and I made a very simple graph of how have Sweden succeeded in, uh, in 40 years of participating in international measurement on education? And I made a simple uh, marking here that if, you are, if Sweden have come in the top class of the nations who participated, I give them a two. And if they are a little bit above the average, it's a plus one, average is zero and then minus one and minus two is used when it really have been bad times. Here you have the results of how Sweden succeeded in the competitions or the comparisons of our literacy. And you see we participated in 1970 with 10 years old, but also with a 15 years old. The 10 years old in Sweden scored very well. We were among the top nations in that compar comparison and we were in top in 1991 where also our 15 year olds were scoring high. Then OECD have helped us to do this, and you see what have happened during the years. We have kept a high level of literacy. We understand what we read when we read it in Swedish. That is what this message says. The PISA studies and the IEA studies, when we participated in the first rounds of mathematical measurement in the first mathematical, the FIMS, and the second one, which is called the SIMS, and then the third, which has been called the TIMS, and been repeated a fourth time as it's called TIMS again. We have scored in the following way. So you could say that we have seen that our school system, 
didn't succeed very well in the 60s and the beginning of the 80s, we made something with it and it started to work better. What we have been doing is that we have used this sort of evaluation, evaluations both in the public debate about schools, so it appears always in the media, we take debates in the parliament uh, and it goes down to the local school. If we can trust the measurements, uh, and we have a, always have that discussion, can we really trust this measurement? It's too narrow. Uh, it doesn't cover the whole thing that we really want to cover. And then we say, but actually we don't have much better uh, measurements. So we, we probably have to accept that, that they exist. Uh, politicians at all levels use the results at the commune level as well at the national level. Teacher organizations sometimes want to get out of focus when we discuss how well we are doing, but they use it, especially when it comes to raising salaries, because one way to solve and create better problem, create problems in a better way is to get better paid. School leaders and teachers use it for local improvement and especially then when we have measured ourselves at the local level. Parents use it to some small extent when choosing a school for the young ones. In Sweden, the parents and the students are free to, to choose a school, whatever school they want to go to. It's their choice. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, schools that nowadays since 20 years we have introduced what we call we don't do not only have uh, commune, commune schools or commune owned schools we also have schools that we call freestanding schools uh, they have become so many so today 10 percentage of the population who goes to the Grundschule goes to a freestanding school which is creating a solution on schooling in another way than the, the mainstream of the commune schools are doing. So that's the idea of having them as, a, as an interesting part of our school system. It was actually introduced by a, a government that was, that was not social democratic, but the social democrats uh, heritaged the idea and they made it their own and it has been kept for 20 years over several political changes. Our national school inspection uses the results as a basis for their inspections that appear every third year. And uh, when I think of how we are doing the work in our schools, you could say that the teachers in our, uh, in our schools are, so to say, very important persons. Uh, they work in such a way that we train our teachers and we, when I look at the, the Grundschule, we take that one, the comprehensive school, the one that runs from when you are seven until you are 16. Uh, in that one we have said to ourselves, it's good to have teachers to follow the same students over a long time. Uh, when we began the Grundschule, teachers were expected or usually followed the students for three years. But we changed our teacher education and nowadays you follow the students from between three up till six years. So you have the same teachers for a long time, which sometimes can be a burden. If the teacher and the family is hating each other, oh, but then you have to develop it. That's life. You live with people who are crazy around yourself. So we have said to ourselves, it's not a good idea to make a, cho make a uh, 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 or create or present a new teacher every year. Let's go with it, because then we can learn how to survive together and solve conflicts. So we are keen on solving conflicts in a peaceful way, also between parents and teachers and students and teachers, and among students, because they have to exist together for nine years. And that could be as long as a marriage, uh, some marriages. <laughs> we expect from our teachers that they base their leadership on learning diagnosis and individual development plans for each student. We expect from them and train them to use feedback to students as well as to parents. 
So the need to do that. We train the teachers. We have them trained at the universities for between three years, that is the preschool teachers, up till four and a half year, that is the upper secondary teachers. Uh, but we don't see teachers as ready products when they leave the universities. We see them as people who will develop for at least during 40 years. So in Sweden we have each year, each teacher is spending 13 days on their in-service training. And we have done so during the last 20 years. When we changed the system in the 50s, we gave the teachers five years per, per five days per year for in-service training. We found after years of changing of school systems, improving the local school, giving more autonomy to the local school, that it was not enough. So we said, we need to train the teachers more often, and usually the teachers train together at the school level, so they go together for 13 days. Some of the days they might, might have as an individual training, but mainly it's a collective body that is training together to solve problems, to learn how to solve problems, and to face them in a new way. We also see our school leaders as most important to carry an autonomous and responsible school. So if we are going to go on with what we have been doing and we have tried to change our school system for the last 50 years in steps, going over from a highly centralized system, when we made the change going from a diversified elite school picking out system over to a comprehensive system, we were a highly centralized system. So we could take a decision and made everyone to do it in the same time. But since then we have seen that the motivation of school leaders and teachers is going down and you need to own the work in your school and be responsible over the resources that are there if you are going to make a high quality work at the school. And therefore we have also tried to create or to work with school leaders that are good on creating good visions together with the teachers that are keen on creating a high internal democracy. We have a lot of decisions that you have to take in a school that in Swedish schools you take it as a full body of the professionals or sometimes you have a specific steering committee where also students and parents are participating. But we request from our school leaders a high degree of professionalism. Therefore, we have developed education for school leaders and we started to do it very systematically from 1975 and onwards. I was then leading our national educational program for school leaders, where we started it before people were selected for a job. In Sweden, you apply for a job as a school leader. Uh, and nowadays, people don't hesitate to do that. When we investigated the situation in 2007, we found that at an average, we had around 15 people to apply for a position as a school leader. So it's a competition to become a school leader in Sweden. You have a higher salary as a school leader, but we created a system in the 70s where people could go together in what we call study circles to use about 10 meetings during a year to taste the role of a school leader before the job starts so that you can feel secure that I want to take this managerial uh, role onto my sh shoulder. When you become a school leader, when you are selected for it, you apply for a position, the local commune decides who we are going to choose. So that is a communal decision taken. When you are getting into the position of being a school leader, and in Sweden, in earlier times, 
we chose people from the same school as the position was taken. After debates in the 70s and 80s, we have created another fashion. Today, almost no one is selected from the body of the school. Why not? We know that if you choose someone from the same school as the position is free, you create problems. Because a person who is a well-known teacher, a good fellow who you can share a nice bottle of wine together with, always have difficulties to change roles and become a leader of that school. So we try to pick out people from other schools. Today, uh, about 80 percentage is taken from another school. But when they start their career as school leaders, they have an introduction period during the early phase. They go to in a, into a deepening education that is a, nowadays a three-year-long education uh, that takes that you participate part-time during the first years of your new job, and you go on within service training. The tasks of the school leader, as we have understood it today, uh, is to work with the subjects or things like this to formulate the ideo ideology of the school, to structure time, tasks and people. And in Sweden, we don't have central timetables, so to say. We have uh, in our national, aid, national uh, curriculum, we say, for instance, about the comprehensive school that you have to distribute the 6,600 hours that the students have during their nine years. But it's up to you as a school to distribute them when they are studying different subjects. We have what subjects they should study, but how you push, put them into, if you use weekly programs according to old traditions, or if you um, compose it into more compromised periods, it's up to you as a school. And that is decisions that are taken by directors and school teachers. The school director, the rector as we call him, or her 65% of the school directors in Swedish in Sweden are women. Uh, so it's a female work nowadays. And that has shifted rather quickly. That is to direct the evaluation work. It is to also show reactions on what people are doing, among other things, in the salary, in the individualized salary. And you have to find solutions on administrative and economic problems. And you have to identify patterns or relations on the school. To work with conflicts is one part where we train our school leaders to deal with that. Not only conflicts between teachers, but also between teachers and parents, and of course between students. We try to influence the brains of the new school leaders to make a choice where they have to develop things where they can go for preservation of solutions in their schools. But they have a great deal of freedom together with their staff to find solutions that they feel is important. And as I said, we have been working with this type of program since 1975. And here I made a small table about how much time we spend on it. And you see that during the first three years, for instance, um, there is about six week, weeks plus homework, as we call it, and annual seminars that is going on. Uh, so we, we actually, what we do in the, in, the, in, the, in the field of education in Sweden is obviously that we believe in education, also of teachers and school leaders. And we see that that has been one of the keys to come over to be able to give the responsibility and the autonomy to the schools. That is by training and preparing teachers and school leaders to take that responsibility. Hadn't we trained the teachers and the school leaders to be good at evaluation, then we had created problems. Evaluations are used when you make distributions of money in the commune, and teachers and school leaders have educated our politicians how to use evaluations. The politicians have the power to make up their minds. We, as well as you, have given or have constructed the political system in such a way, but we also have to inform the politicians so that we can go for sustainable solutions on problems. 
So therefore, we don't change over and over in the educational system. Uh, our last national curriculum was presented in 1994. We have had it for 15 years now. And it takes around 20 years to make a shift of our national curriculums. So over different political agendas, we have to stay with it. And teachers need time, together with school leaders, to find solutions. Yeah, I said something to myself that when I'm here, I might say something about the future. So I say that we think that teachers and school leaders, and that goes for my country, but I have a feeling that it might go for Catalonia too, that more people working in schools need to produce knowledge about their own practice. Because if we are going to be able to, for instance, use evaluations, it's no meaning by measuring the results of what teachers have been doing if you don't understand how the results was created. So as for other professions where you need to understand the relationship between cause and effect, we have tried to help our teachers and school leaders to train their brains to think of cause and effect. The effect is the learning results, the markings of the students, the test results in international comparisons, but the cause is, of course, activities that the students had under the leadership of teachers. So then we have to look at what were we doing, why do we have these variations, and what we think is important is that teachers and and uh, school leaders are engaged in that work so that we don't allow researchers like myself, for instance, to deal with that problem now and then, or all over, because then it will become a specialized uh, part of the academic systems. We also think that teachers and school leaders need to become more systematic in the use of time within their professions to build knowledge in their school about learning processes and results. So that is a feeling, but not only a feeling, it's also a conviction uh, of mine that we need to spend time on that one. Because I know that teachers, who are the main actors among those who get paid in schools, they are not the main actors of schools, that's students. Teachers in the future will probably continue to learn. They will go on by delivering lessons in Sweden, like here in Spain. But I think that teachers need to concentrate hard in the coming hundred years to understand how they can make the same shift of their work as the, the, the medical uh, profession was making a couple of hundred years ago, when they started to find out how you can put a diagnosis on a illness but in uh, the case of teachers, we need to put a diagnosis on a very non-ill situation. That is how we learn. Because if teachers are going to be able to help and support students, they, know, they need to understand and know how learning is appearing. Nowadays, teachers are getting help by brain researchers, but it's not enough. You have to understand it from another part of it. I guess that teachers in the future will, and I especially look at my country where we have this battle going on between the idea of a school being a place where you teach and a school being a place where you learn. That teachers need to go over more and more to lead learning, which is not the same thing as teaching. That is to follow the learners and to challenge them and to push them and to yeah, make life difficult sometimes for the learner. Uh, and we know that within the teaching profession, teachers in the future will cooperate with adults, not only with colleagues, but also with parents. I say to myself that we need to help teachers in the future to understand the local organization much better, especially if we trust the teachers and the school leaders to be responsible for their schools then they understand, need to understand what the school is. And um, we in Sweden 
as you do in Catalonia, we are struggling with the problem of having teachers to losing respect, you could say, or having teachers who are not seen as the most wonderful profession in the world or the highest status. We can't afford to pay all the money that some of us would like to give to teachers. We know that. So we have to work in other ways. Uh, one another way is to have teachers to appear more open, more often in the in the public space to make their voice heard in meetings like this, in the press, on the television. Teachers need to be there to tell stories about how wonderful things they are doing instead of getting only the criticism of where their shortcomings are. So that is something that we work on. And to finalize my little lecture on Sweden, I also can say to you that we have, since the last 30, 40 years, worked hard on getting the teachers and the school leaders to understand their schools as a local organization, where all these factors of a school need to be well known, uh, to be seen, to be observed, to be understood by the people working in a school if they are going to take responsibility for it. So they need to see that they have to have some shared aims, which costs time for teachers and school leaders and parents and students to find out. That you need to develop communication systems that are smart, that are helpful, that create a good deal of flow in the system of communication, where it's also important to look at the groupings of a school. Uh, in many schools, we have seen that we go with a tradition. So, for instance, we don't mixture the ages of the students by some reasons. But we know that students learn better by meeting each other over the barrier of the year when they were born. Because they have a good deal of social learning that they need to do in the school. And younger children want to learn from models who are older, but all younger children don't appreciate teachers as models in their school, so they have to find other models. So therefore we have discussions about how do you do the groupings? The decision-making system is important, especially when you train people to be participants in democracy. Then adult people in schools need to invite not adult people to participate, to have them to train, to express their will, etc. We know that the time budget of a school is very important. We know that the norm is, norms are important, but they have to be seen and known by the school teachers and the school leaders. And so is for evaluation regularities and reward systems. So we try to influence the teachers' brains and the school leaders' brains during their training and during their in-service training with all this. So, and at last, we also know that if schools are going to be responsible and autonomous, it's not enough to create a smart local organization, all, because that takes part or takes, it gives possibilities to go on with what you are expected to reach the learning. But the grown-up people, the adult people, the teachers and the school leaders also need to organize their time, their ways of solving problems, so they act as a learning organization. So that they use their time at school to create learning. So for instance, if you want to make actions in your school that helps you to see what are the better ways, for instance, to learn, which we'll take as example, to learn English. I saw uh, schools in the commune discuss that some years ago when some people in the school said, let's try another way of learning English than having three lessons per week. So they explained to themselves that their school was English territory for, for two weeks. And during that two-week period, everyone in the school was speaking English. So it was a totally crazy period. And in Swedish schools, you have 
not only teachers working there, you have janitors, you have every day we serve a meal to the children, a warm meal, so we have people cooking food. Uh, we have uh, people who are not very well trained in English. We have teachers who work with the handicrafts. I remember the one in one of the schools who was working in English that week. He said to the students, take up the hyvel. He mean a cutter, uh, which is called hyvel in Swedish. And he told the children, I don't know the name of this. You have to find your English teacher. She is sitting somewhere. And I don't care about her. I call this hyvel anyway. And he worked half Swedish with the whole thing. The children loved this period because they saw Swedish teachers, janitors, food people, directors speaking bad English. And their self-esteem in the language English became higher after that period. The school learned that this is an alternative on how we can help people to train such a peculiar thing as a foreign language, instead of having the formal lesson three times for a week. So that is how we do it, and we try to stimulate our schools to think as schools and to learn together with other schools and to follow systematic ways of things that I have written in this little PowerPoint presentation. And last and not least, we try to help school to keep a memory and use it in future situations, which is among the most difficult things to help a school to do. How can we organize memory in a school when we think that teachers and school leaders are the memory? How can we do that? And we try to help ourselves to use, among other things, the computer. So, now you have got some insights into the peculiarity of Sweden. And I suppose I haven't told everything, so there might be questions. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias por la pedagogía de la seva exposición al profesor Mats Ekholm, también por el detalle que nos ha permès fer esta inmersión en el sistema educativo suec y en la escuela, pasando también por una visión global eh, desde las finalidades del que es la escuela, la manera de organizarse, de gobernar, la manera de evaluar, apuntando nuevos indicadores, nuevas maneras de fe, apuntando también todo el tema de la dirección de centros, es decir, que nos ha hecho uh, todo un, un mapa y, y nos ha planteado la posibilidad de, de conocer. Yo, yo en algún momento sentía doncs, que están aquí, como estem a la sala del magma, donde hem, hem viatjat una mica, ¿no? Hem pogut fer una petita inmersión y cuando uno está siempre a l'estranger, doncs això de ben segur que ha provocat sorpresas, eh, es obrir una finestra, otras maneras de fer, otras maneras de organizarse, de evaluar, y de ben segur que això también doncs, ens interroga el, a la nuestra propia manera de, de fer, de organizar, de evaluar el centro educativo y de ben segur que teniu preguntas a fer. Es el momento, doncs de abrir aquest debat y de que pugueu hacer las vuestras preguntas o, o aportaciones. Faremos un primer torn si os asembla bé. Si se checan, ya una más para allá, dos, una otra y alguna otra y una tercera. Fema que estas tres preguntas. Gracias. Uh, de las muchas cosas interesantes que ha dicho, uh, personalmente me interesa mucho la cuestión de um, aprender, cómo aprender, cómo trabajar las emociones a la escuela. Es una de las cosas que en general molt sabem que hacerse adulto limita, en todo caso limita en muchos espais y muchas veces no, no porque hemos trobat otras sortides a, a todo el tema emocional. Sembla que como es adulto has de ser más autocensurado en, en estas cuestiones. No en la expresión, sino propiamente, fins i tot en las emociones. No? Me interesaría, si nos pudieses eh, dar una mica de detalle sobre esta cuestión y potser también relacionado con la cuestión de, de la resolución de conflictos. Gracias. ¿Dónde está? 
Jordi, sí, vale. Eh, Muchas gracias. Creo que hemos visto que Suecia está bastante más lluny que 3.000 kilómetros, que probablemente es la distancia geográfica que tenemos. No? Eh, Dos preguntas de detalle, eh? y no sé si es entrar mucho en la disección del sistema suec, no. Una es eh, eh, en la elección de los directores eh, de centro, del eh, que usted nombraba los líderes de las escuelas, cuando dicen de ser tornen a la docencia, o realmente qui fa la opción de formarse como directivo de un centro escolar ya eh, ja entra, diguéssim, para siempre más en esta aventura de la gestión. Eh, la segunda cuestión es muy concreta. ¿Cuántas son las horas que a la semana los profesores están dedicados a la escuela y si lo tiene presente particularmente en el trabajo a la aula? directamente a los alumnos. Y si hay algún elemento eh, de diferencia entre lo que aquí enumeraríamos la primaria y la secundaria, es decir, en los diversos eh, grupos. Eh, Gracias. ¿Y una otra pregunta para aquí? Sí, hola, buenas noches. Yo quería saber eh, cuántos alumnos ya para aula, aproximadamente, si hay un nombre fixa o es una cuestión variable en función de diversos factores, porque justamente un de los problemas que pienso que son muy importantes en las aulas, eh, tan a primaria y especialmente a secundaria, soy profesora de secundaria, es el nombre muy elevado de alumnat y eso dificulta muchísimo la, las actividades muy más diversas y variadas, que precisamente son las que enriquecen la variedad. Que está para una, para una banda es esta, una de las preguntas. Eh, la otra, y ha habido un momento que cuando usted planteaba eh, los cambios, un cambio importante que va a haber a la educación, perdón, a la educación a Suecia, era una franja de unos años que van a ser dulens y después va a haber el cambio en el que se va a producir. Eh, Bé, un sistema muy més novedós y mejor. ¿Quién eran las causas, si es que las van, van saber, eh, por qué esta educación era deficient en principio? ¿Y quins criterios es van seguir para hacer eh, el cambio a, a una educación mejor? Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Profesor, sí. Si... Si puedo responder, le he de una cierta brevetat en las respuestas porque cumplimos más o menos en el horario previsto. Gracias. Thank you. Yes, I'll try to be that. The, the, the one that is, is most difficult to be brief with is the first question. How do we work on emotions? Because that is a big question. But I can say very briefly that we work very much by giving students Uh, responsibilities, uh, trusting them, and uh, giving a lot of feedback to them, also creating a lot of situations where they can have their emotions and use their emotions, but get reactions on their emotions. When we look at the way we train them or help them to solve conflicts, for instance, we have institutionalized in Sweden that each week in the Grundschule, for instance, you have what we call class council, where you bring up feelings and where you give reactions, the teacher participate, but it's mainly the students and especially when you grow older, but also the young ones, give reactions to each other. So it's a lot of feedbacking. Uh, but I can go on for another night on that topic. So I have to say that there is a good deal to say about it. The appointment of school leaders, uh, What do we do with them when they finish? Well, actually, you are rather mature when you become a school leader in Sweden. The average age is around 45 years old. Uh, and then you stay for about 20 years in the job. Most people stay for the whole 20 year. We have a pension age at 65, 65 to 67. Uh, we made in 2007, as I said, We made an investigation of why do people stop and people go into pension 
very few stop uh, because they feel unpleasant in the job. So they, they stay in job. They stay with the school leadership. Um, I also have to add that school leaders in Sweden are seen as a specific profession. School leaders in Sweden don't teach. You can also become a school leader in Sweden without being a teacher. It's enough that you have pedagogical insights. Uh, and that means that as we have a lot of other people working in schools, usually you are very interested in school if you, will, if you want to become a school leader. But we have school psychologists, we have social workers, uh, nurses, uh, people working with vocational choice, etc. So it's not only teachers there, so we have other people becoming school leaders. How many hours do teachers spend in school? Well, usually they are there at least for 35 hours per week. But 35 hours, that is 60 minute hours. In some schools, they have said to themselves that we shall be there for 40 hours. So this is individual solutions. So we don't have a real national system. Uh, we can reach agreements at the school level or in the communal commune level. But the usual is that teachers are uh, spending with the class as an educator or as a helper of learners. That depends on where they are in the development of what I was talking about earlier. They spend about, uh, if you are a, a preschool teacher, you are there with the children. It's about 25 hours per week directly with the children if you are a, a on this. Group. So I can actually not really tell you uh, in a proper way that we have that system. It's, it's individualized nowadays. Uh, how many students are there in the classroom? Actually, we, we don't participate in the statistics of the European Union on how large our classes are because we destroyed that system 20 years ago when we said Actually, we don't have classes. We have educational groups. So it's another concept. And it isn't really a class. But if I translate what we have, you could say one, one statistical understanding of it is that it goes, in Sweden, it goes one teacher on each seven students. So the ratio is one to seven. But in the class or in the situation where you are an educative person, well, at an average, when we were made some, some investigations some years ago, when I was the director general of the National Agency, we found that people were working together with, when they were between 7 to 11, there were about 20 persons in the room. Uh, and when they became a little bit older, they are, at average, 25, 26 persons in the room. So when they are... Uh, around 14, 15, 16, then they become larger. But that is not true either, but that was an average. <laughs> because if you go with the choices that you have as a student, you go in smaller groups and in bigger groups. So it's a fluctuating system. Uh, and uh, since we are highly decentralized, uh, if I would be really correct, and I wouldn't act as a, your spy in Sweden, I would say, I can't answer your question. Because it differs so much. <laughs> But I will not do that. I show you what we have found in our investigations. Uh, why did we change system? Well, the reasons was that uh, we had a discussion during the Second World War and the years after, where our social democrats and our most conservative party, which in European uh, value scale is a sort of a liberal party, uh, they came together and said that the, the, the system that we had at that time was really a, 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 a system that was, oh, I'm trying to find an English word for slösa, uh, waste. It was a waste. It was a wasting system. Uh, wasting of what? Well, we made some interesting research in the f early 50s where we said that we have a reserve of talented people in this country. 
that never get educated. So we were making intelligence measurement of young people, and then we looked on how many people of different social classes take at that time our baccalaureate. And we found that the, um, the people who belonged to the upper strata in our social system had an intelligence that looked, had a profile, which if we translated that intelligence profile to every strata, you could say that we lost about 20 percentage of the talented people who never get a good education. And that became an uh, economic argument that get the social democrats and the liberals or our conservatives to come together and say, we are not going to waste all these people. We, is, we are a small nation. We need to use our, uh, our talented people. So that was one of the reasons why we said, this is a bad system. The other was that we were very critical towards our way of acting as schools and reacting on students who went through the schools and didn't succeed to uh, get enough high marks. So we had them to go another round. They had to repeat a year. And we started to count on that. And we found that that was, well, we, we had about one third of a year group was actually repeating a year. And then we calculated how much does this cost? And it was a ridiculous high amount of money, not only for the system, but also for the individuals. So we said, let's skip that one. Let's create a school where you are individualizing the passage through the school so that you don't have to repeat classes. At that time, it was about 30 percentage or 35 percentage of a year group. Today, we have one, one and a half percentage of a year group that is repeating a class and that is usually depending on illness, sickness, that you have leukemia or something like that. So that was the main two main big reasons that we had a badly, economically badly working system. So let's make it much better. And then we have gone on with creating ABBA and other international success that creates good money for Sweden. And we long believed for Volvo and Saab, but nowadays we will probably lose it to Chinese people. Muchas gracias. De fet, hem esgotat el temps, però jo havia dit que fèiem un primer torn. Em sabria greu que quedés alguna pregunta. Si és breu, potser encara la podem fer. Hi ha una pregunta? Oi, quantes preguntes, què farem? Brevetat, sisplau, amb les preguntes. Val, molt bé, doncs aquí. Disculpeu, el meu català no és molt bo, l'inglès tampoc. No me queda claro si el director en Suecia hace clase, está directamente en el aula con los alumnos, y de ser así, si el director hace clases, ¿cuántas horas dedica a la semana Al, uh, frente a los alumnos. Gracias. I can give a very quick answer. The school leader, uh, if I give a quick answer and a short one, the school leader uh, is not obliged to teach. There are no obligations for that. Some school leaders want to teach, then they take the decision to have some hours, but there is no obligation. Gracias. Y había una otra pregunta para aquí. Gràcies. Molt ràpidament, jo volia demanar al professor Eckholm si ens podia donar més detalls de les avaluacions externes, especialment les avaluacions nacionals, quines conseqüències tenen, si n'hi ha, a les escoles que tenen resultats més baixos i quines decisions prenen les comunes o les autoritats locals per la millora d'aquestes escoles, especialment en relació amb la pràctica a l'aula dels mestres. Fem la darrera pregunta, si sembla bé, professor. Sí, ha parlat del salari individualitzat del professorat. Jo li volia preguntar quins són els factors que influeixen per tenir aquest salari individual 
i qui és el que pren la decisió d'aquest salari. Paral·lelament, quin és el mecanisme d'accés del professorat a cada lloc de treball. Gràcies. Gràcies. Ok, he de tractar d'anar. Sobre la evaluació externa, en realitat, si una escola es mostra que té bons resultats, la nostra escola d'inspecció és la part externa que té una discussió amb l'escola. La responsabilitat de fer l'escola millor és posada sobre la comuna, So the commune is really responsible and there is, the commune have to find out if the cause of why this school is producing such a bad result uh, depends on bad leadership or whatever. Then the commune have to act. So it is, it is a, the, the, the decision, the, uh, yeah, the, the sharing of the responsibility, the state reacts but the commune have to deal with the problem. Uh, and uh, what the consequences are, usually you have a lot of tough discussions and uh, uh, if there is, I mean, there are, many, there are so many reasons why something can be bad, you have to find individual solutions on it and you do it. Uh, so that is usually a, a lot of forces are brought in when you solve the problems. Teachers unions, school leader unions, uh, the commune, etc. So th there is a lot of discussions before we really do the tough things. Sometimes people have got fired, but that is very rare. That is usually against the Swedish culture. So we don't do it in the British way. They close schools and they fire school leaders and we say, oh, we seldom see real hopeless people. We reform them instead. Uh, and we don't believe in the British way. Uh, what about the individual salary? Uh, What are the factors of uh, deciding on what salary are? In each commune you have a, a good deal of discussion on what are the important factors that we are going to, to, to have very transparent because this is a very important decision to take for teachers and their families and for everyone. So it's a, usually it's a negotiation between the teacher unions and uh, the, the, the commune on at the commune level you create a sort of criteria. And what is in there? Well, it depends, but usually you find that you, you need to have good results among the students if you are going to get a higher salary. But you can also find examples where uh, making a, 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 or taking a leadership role, am role among, the, among the teachers, which means that you act as a team leader. In Sweden you often Work in working teams among the teachers, so that is usually there. Uh, also, if you per, if you contribute to the knowledge base of the teachers, that is also seen as something very positive. So there are, but you have to go to the commune to see it. But this is three uh, things that is rather often appearing there. Who is taking decisions on of the of the salary? Well, that is, if you look at it legally. It is actually a decision taken by the school director, so to say, the, the school leader. But that is, uh, you, you can't take it in a good way without having a negotiation with the teacher union. Uh, and of course, you have to, to uh, tell the person who you take the decision for. And usually in most schools, you really give a motive. Why did I take this decision? Uh, and... Uh, But you also ask for um, mechanisms to, uh, to, to, well, how do teachers get the job? Is that what you ask for? Uh, how we do it is, is the same with the school leaders. You appoint for a job. And uh, in Sweden you have, uh, yeah, you have a good competitions of, between teachers of, about jobs within the humanistic sector, within language where it is very easy to get, uh, to get a teacher job is if you are working within the field of natural science. Because our engineers or our natural science interested people usually disappear from the school. So we have difficulties to 
catch people there. We try it and we try over and over again and usually the best natural science interested people who go to the through the universities disappear into other branches and schools. But what you do is to apply for a position and then you have a competition and if you are lucky you win or if you are a smart person you apply for a position up far in Lapland where it is very cold and you get the position immediately and they are very happy that they succeeded to get you there and you will freeze like hell hmm? and you don't see the sun for a couple of months during winter time. Bé, moltes gràcies. Un cop més al professor Matt Zeichholm, que ens ha acompanyat en aquest debat d'educació d'aquest vespre. Agrair també al MACBA, que ens acull un cop més en aquesta sala, i també agrair-vos a totes vosaltres i a tots vosaltres l'haver estat aquí, la vostra assistència, i dir-vos que ja sabeu que podeu entrar a la web de debats d'educació i sentir la conferència i veure el vídeo de la conferència i també poder recollir bibliografia i informació d'interès del ponent, sempre que vulgueu. També, per aquells que estigueu interessats, tenim les dues properes dates dels propers debats d'educació. Tenim el 19 de gener el François Dubé i després el 9 de febrer Jap Dronkers. Són les dues dates dels propers debats d'educació del proper any. 19 de gener i 9 de febrer. Res més. Bona nit a totes i a tots i moltes gràcies.